Hi, welcome to this week's Texas Alliance for Life update. I'm here with Risa Sadler. Risa is here from the Rafa Clinic. Risa, I would love for you to share with our viewers where the Rafa Clinic is located and just a little bit more about you, your background, and what you do at the clinic. Well, Rafa Clinic is located in Greenville, Texas, which is in Northeast Texas. We are about an hour Northeast of Dallas, um, and we serve the, pretty much that entire Northeast Texas area in some form or fashion. So we are a pregnancy center. We do provide the pregnancy testing services and ultrasound services. Um, we also work uh, to help equip our families after they've chosen to parent or place for adoption. We walk through um, I, I was just sharing with you off camera, we have some families we've walked through with years. Um, we actually had a follow-up yesterday with a young lady. We've been, uh, for eight years, we've been servicing her and her family and helping her. So um, it's just a sweet privilege that we have to be able to come into people's lives and sometimes some really hard situations. And they invite us in to um, help kind of take the next step. And we, we love that. So I actually have been involved in pregnancy center work since 1999. So I'm going on 22 years now of working in different aspects. My background is nursing and that's what first drew me to this work. Um, I was actually an oncology nurse in Dallas for a number of years and then um, saw the mission of the pregnancy center. Um, I am a post-abortive woman and I've actually shared my story there um, with the sonogram bill um, of just my own personal testimony that drew me to this work. But I will say once I started volunteering at a pregnancy center, it gets in your blood. And um, I've been there ever since. And so that's what drew me in is helping with medical services. And then I've been executive director now for about 12 years. Quite a journey to go from nursing to serving in a pregnancy resource center to directing it. I guess within that, you can see your heart for people in general, to be an oncology nurse, I would imagine is tremendously difficult to walk people through some of the hardest moments of their life uh, and then to be able to celebrate, you know, the stories that turn out with a happy ending. But you, you can kind of carry that same heart into what you do here. You walk women through some of the hardest moments of their life when they get the news that they're facing an unplanned pregnancy and they're not sure how to move forward. The reason for my interview today is to talk about the Heartbeat Act and how it's affecting your work at the Rafa Clinic. The Heartbeat Act, for those who don't know, took effect September 1st in the state of Texas. And since that time, it has been illegal for abortions to take place once a heartbeat is detected, which typically is around six weeks into pregnancy. It's been almost two months, amazingly, that this Heartbeat Act has protected lives in our state. So, Teresa, how... Has this act affected your clinic, your staffing, your services, your hours? What are you guys seeing there in Greenville? We, because we're rural, we we see a larger area. We see girls who are willing to travel um, to get abortions. I mean, you know, where we live, that you go into Dallas to do shopping, so it, it's not any big deal for them to travel an hour to two hours to go and get an abortion. And so for us to reach them um, has always been a challenge. But one of the things that I've loved seeing and that I think I didn't anticipate the breadth of is the amount of increase in patients that we've seen that have come to us since September 1st. Um, like I said, we are a small rural center, um, but we anticipated some increase. So we had worked to make sure our nursing staff was ready, our hours were ready. We launched a new website specifically. Um, mm -hmm for the medical services in September. And since then, I was just, I ran some fresh numbers from September 1st of last year um, to today and then uh, to October of last year. And then from September 1st of this year till today. And just in pregnancy testing, um, the girls coming in, we've seen about a 29% increase, but in ultrasound. So those girls that are coming and they're very early and we're having to bring them back a few days later and scan again or, or continue that care with them until they make a decision of what they're going to do mm -hmm. with their pregnancy. We've seen a 180% increase in ultrasounds. Um, I, that number actually shocked me. I knew we'd been busy, but I didn't realize it was that, that high. And so I, I kind of drilled through those numbers and looked and the phone calls, the notes that I'm reading, 
that it seems that the girls um, and the, their their boyfriends or their parents that are calling us, they are calling us earlier because of the time frame with the new law. Um, they also seem to be um, just much more determined to make this happen, which makes our job more challenging. Um, one thing that I've been really proud of Texas Pregnancy Centers for doing since September 1st is, um, as Jana Pinson and Corpus says, um, we pivot, right? You you have new challenges and new things. And that's one of the things that in pregnancy center work is we've had to change the way that we provide services. We see them as, as walk-ins and same day. You know, you provide that ultrasound the same day. You provide the services the same day. Because if if we have to be available to them and we love that we have the ability and resources to do that. Um, but the girls that are coming in are asking questions about the new laws. They're asking questions about um, who can get in trouble if they decide to go have an abortion. Can they get in trouble? So what we've seen is a lot of it is educating them about the new laws, educating about fetal development, educating about what their options are. Um, but what's been an interesting turn too is we've seen those same questions from our donors and our supporters of, do you still need to be open? That was a question I didn't anticipate because they just didn't understand the new, um, the new laws in Texas. So if we've been able to educate them as well of, if anything, we are more needed at this point. And, you know, simple math tells us how many women will now have children who a year ago may not have chosen to parent or place who are going to need our support. And um, so we've also increased the availability of services for those women who are carrying children to term to be able to help them with resources and education as they get ready for their babies and after they have them. It is amazing that you guys are in a position where you're having to help people understand the law. And I know that you're a part of an amazing network and the Texas Pregnancy Care Network has done a phenomenal job of equipping the pregnancy resource centers, pregnancy help centers across the state that are a part of that, that umbrella of that organization with tools to explain the ins and outs of this to both women and, as you're saying, donors. The donor questions is something new that I hadn't heard until today. And it's fascinating to see how people's wheels are spinning and they're wondering what does support for women look like when abortion is illegal. And that's been our goal in Texas since the passage of Roe v. Wade is to make abortion illegal again in Texas. And, you know, for us here at Texas Alliance for Life, we had another bill that passed uh, this last session and it's the Human Life Protection Act. And, and that places in the books that should Roe v. Wade be overturned, then immediately when that happens, abortion becomes illegal in Texas. So it, it's decided. And this is kind of a, a dress rehearsal from that. This protects life from heartbeat to birth. And then that one would cover before heartbeat to heartbeat and then to birth. And so we're always trying to close the gaps and protect the life. But what I feel is that your work will become even more important as we move towards our goals, because when abortion is not an option in Texas, then pregnancy help centers will have even more work to do to help equip moms to carry their babies to term and either keep them or place them for adoption or assist them in other ways in the journey. And so uh, I just see that the numbers that you're seeing, the increases that you're seeing is what we'll continue to see as we see life protected. So and, and it's been interesting. We've been able to connect with our, our communities because, you know, this is what winning looks like. This is what's what it's going to be like. And, and, and we're excited. This is what we've been praying for. And this is the time for those of us who support life to kind of this is where the rubber meets the road. And we need to be up in our game to support these families because they're going to come to us first. They're going to go to our churches. We have to be ready for them. And so um, we, I don't know that we were as prepared for that as we probably could have been because of, of just, we honestly didn't think the law was going to stand, right? <laughs> we were excited that it did, um, but it's been amazing to see how the ministries that serve pregnant women and mothers in Texas have stepped up their game. 
um, and have been just on those front lines and doing that. And, and I, we're just happy to, that we get to be a part of that. I love it. You pivoted, as you said, and then you just kept running. And yeah. that's what you do. And I love that. We're still running. It's a great <laughs> mental picture. <laughs> yeah. But this is what winning looks like. That's a great uh, soundbite, a great way to look at this. This is what winning looks like. And every life saved in Texas because of any of our pro-life laws that pass is a win. And so we celebrate the wins. Um, so we mentioned a little bit about the questions your donors have. That's one way that you guys receive funding for what you do. But you're also recipients of the Texas Alternatives to Abortion Monies, which our lawmakers this past year increased the budget of to $100 million, which is perfect timing. And then um, being a part of the Texas Pregnancy Care Network, you uh, are then able to be a recipient of those funds. So we get asked a lot in interviews with reporters, what does Texas do to help moms? You know, there's this misperception and even intentional misinformation that's put out into the public that we just care about protecting life, but we don't do anything to help moms in our state. This is just one of the ways that Texas helps women among many. How has that program helped your center accomplish your goals and do more to meet the needs of the of the women and the families that come in? You know, I've been doing this long enough. I've done this work without the Texas Pregnancy Care Network as well. And it was a, a big change for us when that opportunity came up. For us, what it's allowed us to do is the services that we were providing for education, for pregnancy, um, you know, getting ready for baby, nutrition, but material goods, diapers, formula, wipes, um, car seats, cribs, maternity clothing, even. And um, just a few weeks ago, we were able to provide shoes for a young mom who literally came in for a pregnancy test with no shoes on. And so we were able to help with that. Um, that funding, you know, we, we all have great donors and supporters that do that, but it allowed us to expand those services so that we weren't just saying, you know what, I'll send you over to our Salvation Army or our Goodwill and good luck we were able to take care of that need. So it's allowed us to do those. We, um, it's also allowed us to be able to expand the number of staff that we have to serve women because we don't sell a product, right? Our thing that we provide is time and we provide those resources to them. So it's allowed us to expand those, just the availability that we have. Um, for us, because we serve so many families with education and that goes up until um, um, 36 months is our focus, those first few years that are so difficult. Um, for us, that it's allowed us to just expand our services. We're adding another facility just to focus on education and families and counseling and fatherhood programs. And, and that's something that our community desperately needs. There's no one else out there that's been able to do that well. And the alternative to abortion funding has allowed us to change those families and equip them. And our goal with that is a family, abortion may not be an, uh, even on the table for them right now, but if their circumstances in life are such that they are living in poverty or there's addiction or abuse or whatever it may be, and then an unexpected pregnancy does happen, then abortion becomes an on the table option for them. So our focus in, in equipping families and walking with them is that if we can help break some of those cycles through education, through that funding, then if an unplanned pregnancy happens again, their circumstances, it's, it's like they have more tools in their toolbox, right? That they can, they can now say, you know what, we can do this. Whatever that big obstacle that they see that's pushing them toward abortion, they now that they have resources right there in their community that can help them with those big obstacles. It may be they need housing or they need transportation, they need whatever. The extra funding allows us to be a resource for them that we were never able to do before. It was always, we were having to try to find something else. And for us to being in such a rural area with no public transportation, very little housing opportunities, this funding allowed us to be that resource for them. And so we've, we've seen it definitely be a game changer, not just for our organization, but for the families in our community who are benefiting from them. And so we are very, very thankful for those funds and how they help truly change. I believe they change families and, and 
my children, our children's generation, at least in our area, will our hope is that they're different. They have a different life where abortion's not an automatic go-to um, when a hard thing happens. But now they know they have somewhere that they can go to that they have solid resources available. And removing obstacles is saving lives. And so it sounds like you're doing a great job of that. So how can people help you help the clinic in what you do? We've mentioned, of course, donating. And I, I looked at your website before we talked and you guys have a, a very visible uh, donate button on there. And so that's, that's obviously one way. But what are some other ways that people can support the work of the Rafa Clinic? I would say for us, I mean, definitely because I know your audience, um, prayer always is our first and foremost that we ask for. And I know that sounds like, you know, maybe a a one-off of just your basic answer, but every day is literally a battle for life and death in what we do. We show up and, and I've often, often compared it to a medical mission because being a nurse, you know, going overseas and offering medical care in a third world country, we get to literally drive downtown in our hometown city and do the same thing. We unlock that door every day and we never have, we never know what's going to come through that door. We never know what's going to be the other end of that phone call. So prayer support is essential um, for us. Um, The second thing I would say is, you know, finding your local pregnancy center. You know, for those of us in East Texas, come see what we do. Because just like you said, so many people don't understand the breadth of the services that a pregnancy center does um, typically. And so I would, you know, I always welcome Come see what we do. Even if you're not sure if you support what we do, come see and let us have that conversation. We've had pro-choice people within our community who've contacted me and I said, come, let's have the conversation. I welcome those things. Um, Most pregnancy centers have a needs list. For us, diapers and formula and wipes, we use like water um, because of just the circumstances in our world right now. Um, But definitely volunteers. If you have a skill set and you think, I don't know if I can talk to someone about abortion or I'm not a nurse, that doesn't matter. We have right now our particular organization, um, we've had job postings open for months that we can't fill and we need those filled. Um, We also have 70 families, the last time I checked the list, who are waiting for mentors, who are asking for help. They're sitting there waiting. Um, So I would say definitely checking in with your volunteers. It just requires a few hours a week and the, the the impact that you are allowed to make and the, what you get back from them. It's like I said earlier, once it's in your blood, you'll, you'll keep coming back um, because you get to make an impact in your community in a way that no one else is doing. That's right. And outreach really does start in our own backyard. So I'm actually going to ask you a question that I didn't present to you ahead of time. But in looking at your website, I saw that one of the services that you offer is abortion recovery. And I think one of the little known areas of service to women from pregnancy health centers or pregnancy resource centers is abortion recovery. And so can you just take a moment and let our viewers know if there's anybody watching today who feels like, that might be something that they want to look into to get some healing in their own heart for something that they've walked through in their past. Can you just share a little bit about what that looks like? Yeah. And I agree. I think it's one of the things that we don't talk about very often. And that's part of what we're trying to change is that this is an okay subject to talk about. Um, I shared with you earlier, I am post-abortive. I had an abortion at 19 as a freshman in nursing school. Um, And it was honestly one of those things that I thought I saw the crisis, right? I saw the obstacle. How am I going to finish school? And I thought that was the answer. I very quickly realized that was not the right answer for me. Um, And I I didn't talk about it. I hid it for years. I didn't want anyone to know. Um, I felt judged. I felt um, guilty. That was my personal reaction to my abortion experience. And I was actually sitting in a church and saw it in the church bulletin that if you've ever had an abortion and you want to talk, call this number. And I thought I didn't need that because I was good. I was good. My husband, on the other hand, realized how much my abortion still affected so much of my life that I was blind to see. And it was through reaching out to what ended up being a a local pregnancy center. Um, I I reached out to them and I started in a small group of women who'd all had abortions in their past. So we were sitting there 
um, sharing our our burdens and our stories. And then we, um, the one I went through was based on Psalm 51, which is David's Psalm of Repentance with Bathsheba. And um, just walking through that healing process in a in a confidential setting with a group of women who we all came to the table with the same circumstances was short of my salvation, the best decision I ever made. Um, it was a life changer. I believe it's made me a better woman. It's made me a better mother, a better wife. Um, and just to know that it's not the unforgivable sin. So I would encourage you, even if you have prayed and received forgiveness, or if you're still struggling with it, or maybe you just don't know how it's still affecting you, um, find your local recovery, find your pregnancy center and let them connect with you because it's not something you have to walk with and carry by yourself ever. Um, it's definitely something that having that resource available to for whether it was you had an abortion last Saturday or you had an abortion before Roe v. Wade ever even was an, an idea. It doesn't matter. There's still healing to be found there. And I think it's it's one of the best things that we're able to provide our community. Thank you for sharing that personal background and how you found healing and how other women can do the same. And and I know I've, I've served in ministry before being at Texas Alliance for Life. Anytime anything is brought out into the open, that there's no more power in that for the enemy to use it over us. And once it's brought to the light, we can find healing. And and so often that happens in community where together we share and and hold each other up. And so I think that's a great setting. And I want to encourage women to um, go and participate in that if you feel like it's a need for you. And then you can get to a, a healed and healthy place where you can also help others overcome. So, Teresa, thank you so much for being with us today. I have really enjoyed talking to you and getting to know you better. Thanks again for tuning in to this week's TAL update. We look forward to seeing you back here again next week.